Okay, our final part this evening, and to wrap it all up, um, I'm very pleased to introduce um, our speaker from Syngenta, Max New... Newbert, so yeah, it really is the outside, early onset Alzheimer's kicking in, um, who's going to talk about you know, what is Syngenta's interest and what, why is Syngenta interested, interested in biocontrols. So please give a big round of applause to Max. Yeah, so we've heard from uh, different sectors of the market, but now I'm going to move on to what the industry sees uh, in biocontrol and how it has been mentioned many, many times is an integral part into an integrated pest management program. Um, and what has been touched on in that last Q&A session was what is the overriding issue uh, in the industry of agriculture right now, which is an ever-increasing population, uh, but then actually the reduction in our ability to year on year improve those yields to match that population and feed ourselves. On top of what you see on, on the right there, where we've got a finite amount of land and we've got 0.3 of a billion hectares of undefined land left which could be used but as we said it's probably rainforest so what we actually want to do is not use that and make the most of what we do have and get the highest yields, yields possible um, and as we said we'll need a figure so uh, this is from Jason Clay um, at the Worldwide Fund of Nature and we can see in the next 40 years, we're going to have to produce the same amount of food we had produced in the last 8,000 years due to the increase in population we are going to have within that time. And obviously, you can see that's going to be a huge challenge for ourselves um, as well as the rest of the world. And then to throw that into the context of how do we keep producing that yield, we obviously want to keep crop protection relevant. Um, but what we're ever always seeing is that increase in costs that industries having to pay for, uh, for regulatory reasons to get a pesticide registered. And as you can see here, um, in sort of 1995, you're paying a total of 152 million. Um, the research part of actually finding the, the component of a new crop protection uh, product was about 72 million. And actually, if you see relatively close to today, we're still uh, nearly a decade now, out now, uh, but research was 85 million. So actually, that's, that's pretty good. We, we've kept it in line with inflation, basically, there, because we've increased, uh, increased throughput of trying to find those active ingredients, and we've become better at discovering um, those AIs and producing them. But what has dramatically increased, as you can see, is that development cost, which is doing the trials and getting all the necessary data of those AIs for the registry process. So that's what our big, big opposition is. And as we mentioned uh, with biopesticides, we still have that issue. In some ways, it can be a bit easier because what the EU does now, we have a, a, a risk a hazard-based uh, system where if it's a hazard, that will be cause the main issue with it. So obviously, biopesticides have reduced hazard, as we all said. We know how they act in the environment, and we know that they're probably very low hazard, whereas uh, sort of traditional chemistry has a high hazard but potentially low risk. But the risk is now not what we really see as the issue. So just to sort of reiterate those points, um, because of that increased cost, we're actually seeing a reduction in funding into making IOs, which has caused now basically for the industry, we're producing about 1.2 new AIs a year compared to the 1980s, where we're doing about four. And then on top of this, we have, as we all probably know and well aware of, are the EU uh, withdrawals outpacing actually the input into the industry. So we're at this sort of standpoint in history where we're losing a lot of active ingredients yet the, industry, uh, the world needs more from us. Uh, so we've got this really stressful moment really for the industry and on top of that we've got because of those regulatory issues a smaller and smaller actual, uh, chemical space we can look for new AIs in. So the top there is sort of best case scenario the area of all the active ingredients we could find along with their mobility in the soil and their persistency. We don't want them too mobile and we don't want them too persistent because then they'll get to places we don't want them to be and then they'll be in the water courses, etc. And at the bottom there you can see what is more like what we're sort of working in now. We've got a very finite amount of space. We can find those AIs which fit the sweet spot of actually being, have a good efficacy of being an AI and being an active ingredient but aren't causing issues for the environment 
or for non-target pests. So where biocontrol sits is perfectly in that space, where it's going to have high efficacy, but we're going to have very low hazard and risk. Because really, what should be happening in biocontrol is that you've got a product which has very specific activity, but for the environment in general and for us, the users, the consumers, much, much safer. So what I'm going to try and show you today is how Syngenta's put a lot of power research behind this because we see ourselves as one of the best developers of biocontrols. Um, and what we're going to see now in this presentation is an RNAi approach. So what RNAi is, is a very specific way to control pests. It's a different mode of action because what it's actually doing is interrupting uh, organisms' natural processes of producing a very useful protein that it will use to do something integral to its, basically, existence. What's fantastic about this approach is that it can actually be used just like you would use any other crop protection product. So you can spray it and apply it to a crop. So it doesn't mean you have to have a new infrastructure to apply this. And it can be, what we've all been saying, compatible with other approaches, which is fantastic. And with, a, uh, with RNAi, you'll also see that will be compatible with beneficials and other biological approaches. And, but all the time giving you that very high efficacy level that we want from a product. So how it works is that you spray double-stranded RNA onto your crop as a foliar application. That will go onto the crop, and then the pest will consume that double-stranded RNA. It's a natural process with higher organisms, basically anything higher than yeast, will ha not see uh, double-stranded RNA as something it should have it within its body, because a lot of the time that will be a viral piece of RNA, double-stranded RNA. Usually we only have single-stranded. So what it will do, it will chop it up, and those small bits of RNA will then split apart, and what they will do is attach to, if they've got a specific sequence, attach to a very specific part of the organism's messenger RNA, which was going to produce a protein, attached to it, and then induce that same effect where the animal itself or organism itself will chop it down, remove its own messenger RNA, producing no protein. So you're making a block to something that could be very essential for the organism, such as replication, uh, ion channels, anything that you might imagine would be essential for the pest to propagate perfectly. But then what also this means is that because you're making it to a specific gene sequence, you can make it highly specific. So you, as in this image here, you can see we've got rid of all the bugs, but we leave the bees perfectly alone well. They're not being affected at all, but we've got high efficacy. So this is a quick video to show you that in actual uh, motion. What we have on the left is a treated plant with RNAi targeted to Colorado potato uh, beetle, and then the untreated on the right. And the period over about five days, what you'll see is that as they're taking up the RNA, they'll be able to stop producing a certain protein, they'll die off, and there won't be any uh, predation except from the very first day or so on the treated and on the untreated, they'll uh, continue to grow, eat, and at the very end of this video, you basically see a stick of a plant left, which is about 189 hours, I think. So as you can see, decimation. So obviously this is a sort of a Latin America problem, but you can see the devastation that caused by those pests compared to the RNAi uh, spray plant. So fantastic results, high efficacy, very specific which will be shown in the next slide. So these two bugs, Colorado potato beetle and the milkweed leaf beetle, very highly related. Um, different species, but very highly related. What we produced was two different RNAIs to target each one specifically. So what you can see on the left there is when we're targeting the potato beetle at the top, we target the potato beetle, but not the blue milkweed beetle. Then we go on to test the RNAI targeted at the milkweed uh, beetle, and we, again, target it. But if we combine both of those RNAs together in a mixture, it, we can kill both. So you've got high specificity, and you can make mixtures. So that means you can then, if you've got a certain set of issues, you can make these mixtures and produce, on the right there, um, wonderful levels of control and tailor it to your specific pests. So that's all well and good. I've showed you it in, basically, lab conditions. But what we've all been saying is, how does this get to Broadacre? How does this get to the arable landscape? And because I was saying 
it can be used as a foliar application just like you would spray the normal insecticide. You can take it to field level. And so in this trial, we had a, 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 a plot which was highly infested with the Colorado beetle. And it was sprayed, as you see at the top, the uh, RNA-based control and the entries are underneath, and you can see the stark difference there. And what we saw, it was highly effective, not against only the adults, but also the larvae. As long as you're targeting something that the pest is going to be producing throughout its life cycle, it's going to be effective for its life cycle, as long as it can get into the, the, the pest. And most importantly, we saw it was statistically equivalent to traditional approaches. So this means it's not, you're not losing out on paying more for a product which potentially could not work as well as normal uh, crop protection AI. And what is most important, what we've been saying uh, about beneficials is obviously we ha usually have thresholds for spraying so you don't kill the, uh, the beneficials that might predate on the pests. It doesn't have any effect on the beneficials. So what you're getting is a fantastic product which is killing off the pest, target pests, but even beneficials to also help you wipe up any of the leftovers. And no phytotoxicity as well. So all round a fantastic uh, new product and could be cusp of a new future for uh, crop protection. But what's always been the problem with RNAi approaches, RNA technically is very fussy. It always breaks down, which in some respects obviously is fantastic because we know once you sprayed it, it's not going to last around. You won't have any problems with having it staying on your crop as a residue. But even if you did, RNA, it, RNA is everywhere, so that's not even an issue in itself. So that problem with being breaking down the soil was um, assessed in this trial where we formulated it so that it would persist long enough to actually be a viable control. And this, it was a corn rootworm, so not relevant for Europe again, but goes to show what it could be used for. And what we have in this trial is the RNA uh, I approach at one times uh, concentration up to four times uh, in a formulation where it makes it persist, makes it work better compared to it just straight amounts being concentration. And what you can see, when we formulate it, you can really get a very high level of efficacy, even in soil, which previously thought could be a difficult situation for this uh, type of crop protection. And what we see is that if you formulate it, you can get nearly as good levels, well, statistically as good levels of control at four times when you just do it at one time the formulation. So this, this is the next step. We're seeing that this is a real viable technology, four levels of crop protection. And then the other issue we always thought was, oh, OK, so how do we get this RNAi approach into a sucking pest? So obviously, at the moment, we've been spraying it on things that chew, which means it's on the surface of the plant. But what we find is that because RNA is a natural thing, and we have seen it in natural processes, it can go across barriers, it does work for sucking pests. It penetrates into the plant. As you can see here, the green stink bug, which is a sucking pest, it will enter the plant and protect it over those 13 days compared to the control. So we sort of establish that if we work hard enough and formulate well enough, we can actually make it an effective approach for crop protection. So, so just to sum that up, that we can see this is going to be really huge for the potential future of crop protection. Syngenta is going to put a lot of power into this because it has all the sort of benefits we want. We've got high efficacy, we've got high specificity, and low risk and residues, and it's, uh, it's a really good product. And to make sure that we're transparent and open with the public and yourselves, we've got an approach where you can go to our link here and actually look at the data that's behind some of this, what I showed you today, to make sure that we don't have any issues with people understanding what this approach is and what it means. Because actually, this is a fantastic approach and could change agriculture. And with that, thank you very much for listening. Well, that, that's, uh, that, I found that really encouraging, actually. So uh, it's good to see that something, hopefully, I mean, I'm not expecting it on the market in the next few weeks, I guess, but uh, that, that, that looked really promising. So thank you very much for that. Um, I'd love to run another Q&A session now, but I'm afraid we haven't got time. But uh, just a few final things. One is that for those of you in the room, 
please feel free to hang around. We've got some more refreshments at the back, and if you do want to ask Max some questions, I've certainly got some questions for him, um, he is going to hang around a bit, and the same goes for our other two speakers. Um, if you've enjoyed this Arable Horizons, I see some of you who've been to at least two or three of the other sessions. We have one more in the series. It's that one over there, which is on climate change. Uh, so if you're interested in applying for a place at the final Arable Horizons lecture, which is being held in Cambridge, um, I can't remember what the venue is, but it's somewhere in Cambridge anyway. British Antarctic Survey, British Antarctic Survey. thank you James, in Cambridge. Um, then please go to the website and uh, you'll find all the information about it there. Um, I want to once again thank Syngenta for making this all possible and for supporting what I think is a really worthy enterprise. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Um, and can we give one final round of applause to all of our presenters tonight? So for those, those of you watching at home, that's the end of tonight. For those of you in the room, let's go and have some more refreshments and continue the discussion. Thanks. <laughs>